out of all the adjectives a long time ago. So we'll skip the romance and call it for what it is, a resource, a prime natural resource. Power. America is rich in natural resources. But we would be poor without the means of moving the products of our mines, fields, and forests. This, through railroad transportation, we have been able to do for over a century. Wrote one reporter, the hammering home of the Golden Spike in Utah Territory now gives us a road to the Indies. Back east that day, they even rang the Liberty Bell. Knitting town with town, market with market, the railroad brought prosperity to America. Joseph Pickett, a country artist, sensed it all. Factory, store, home, church, and school, unified by a set of rails. We have entered another age. Yet the factories and markets of our nation are still bound together by rails of shining steel. Panoply, thy measured dual throbbing, and thy beat convulsing. So wrote Walt Whitman about the Iron Horse. The poet would have felt the same about the motive power which moves over the rails today, four times as efficient as only a few years past when the advent of the diesel ended the historic age of steam. tradition, the rails and roadbed, leading us in ever new directions, form the very symbol of the American Railroad. Today, the railroad industry continues to provide us with new directions in transportation, new directions affecting us all. A look into the future begins with a look at the new directions of railroading in our own time. Welded rails in quarter mile lengths mean maintenance economies that help bring freight rates down. An easier ride for people and for goods in transit. And yet another mark for travel safety. Years ago, when our railroads were laying down the new directions of a developing nation, the tracks mainly followed the contours of the land. Today, old curves and bends are being straightened, grades reduced and grade crossings eliminated for increased speeds, faster schedules. And to accommodate the big new cars and high loads of modern industry, narrow cuts are being widened, low clearance tunnels unroofed. Daylighting, they call it.
So from the roadbed up, our railroads are moving in new directions. Old concepts, old sights and sounds are gone forever. Yet a railroad can't shut down and retool overnight for next year's model. Changes must be made constantly, with the result that a modern railroad is always ultra-modern. In applying electronic technology to daily operations, no industry has been more resourceful than our railroads. Into the command post from the field comes a steady flow of tactical intelligence. Instantly, via microwave from unmanned electronic scouts, deployed at strategic intervals along the right-of-way, the reports arrive with the intimate details of freight car and traffic movements throughout the system. The time and place of arrival and departure, and the locale of passing of scores of trains, as well as the size, weight, contents, ownership, destination, and handling instruction for each of thousands of cars. What a way to run a railroad. Indeed it is. Here's an example of electronic surveillance in the field. The all-weather scanner used in but one of the new automatic car identification systems. As with an alert operative in any branch of security intelligence, this stalwart sentinel can grade and classify the subject at a glance. Its campaign ribbons give the car away, the telltale light values of the differently colored labels being retro-reflected on a revolving mirror. Instantly, they are decoded, then and there, and even as the train keeps rolling, are transmitted to the command post. With such devices, the art of railroading takes on the aspect of pure science. Of all railroading's dynamic changes, whether of electronics, motive power, track, or roadbed, None means more to the shipper than what is happening to the basic transport vehicle itself. Customerized is the word for the freight car of today. Like the new streamlined tank car for the chemical industry, which carries four times more heavy phosphorus than the standard tank car. For shipping finished lumber, the side-loading all-door car has proven a cost-saving innovation. Loading and unloading become a matter of minutes, no longer the hours it used to take, plank by plank with the ordinary boxcar. When fully loaded, the side doors are lowered to protect the shipment from the elements. With liquid hydrogen, as with heavy phosphorus, the chemical industry's problem is how to ship enough. For liquid hydrogen is a fuel demanded by our space program. Yesterday, it had to be shipped bottle by bottle, hundreds cautiously stacked together. Now, a single pressure-controlled car, actually one big bottle, does the job. Customerized. For shippers of dry bulk materials, white flour to carbon black, and especially cement, there's a whole family of aerated cars, cars that breathe. These center flow hoppers are equipped with a pneumatic loading and discharging mechanism that enables them to inhale at the plant and at the end of the run to exhale at trackside into specially designed trucks for delivery directly to the destination, whether construction site or factory eliminating costly storage facilities. Customerized, 
for coal, a four-car and one super jumbo with 16 doors that empty 17 tons in 15 seconds. Designed under railroad supervision by an aerospace firm. Customerized for the colossal deadweights of turbo generators, a special flat car adaptation. Today, railroad men keep abreast of the dynamics of marketing, seek out the customer, and treat his problems as their own. Tank cars? No. Whale-sized storage tanks for LP gas, built in Pennsylvania for a customer in Washington state. Five railroads working together figured out just how to transport them across the continent fully fabricated. Else, they'd have been shipped in pieces for assembly at destination. Customer service like this is bringing traffic back to the rails. An outstanding example of the railroad freight renaissance is the automobile rack car train, one of the great transportation success stories of our time. How did it come about? Hello? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. Time, a weekday morning a few years ago. Place, office of a railroad's traffic vice president. Calling from Detroit, yes, the traffic hard. director of an automobile company. Well, we've been studying it, and I think our design people have uh, come up with a car that's uh, going to be the answer to all your problems. How to design a car that would do a better job of long-haul transport at lower rates than the automotive industry itself could do on the highways. Gentlemen, this is what our mechanical group has come up with, and we think that... There would be many meetings of the inter-industry task force, for. railroad, equipment manufacturer, sure and automobile, automobile company. And equipment friends for some comment. That's quite a rig you've got there, but uh, wouldn't that height give you some problems with bridges and tunnels? Well, it might in some areas, Bill, but uh, it's certainly nothing that we can't handle. It was a challenge. Their goal was a completely new auto transport vehicle, something never seen before, a new direction. Well, what about our tie-down system? We have a chain and winch arrangement. Many were the ideas considered, many the technical obstacles surmounted as model followed model. All that was a few years ago. Today, the majestic rack car train on its tight schedule, just like a deluxe passenger express, is visible proof that the railroads have joined with the auto industry to identify problems, find solutions. Each rack car carries 15 standard size automobiles. In one train, over 100 rack cars, over $7 million worth of automobiles, and all removed from long haul delivery over the highways. The railroad chapter in our rack car story hasn't quite concluded. The arrival of the high cars seems rather like an ocean liner coming into port. It sets in motion a series of unloading activities for which the carrier remains responsible until all the cargo is off the dock. It's the story of total transportation, of which railroading's chapter is certainly significant. And it's a success story for the railroad industry, for the automotive industry, and for millions of automobile buyers. Only when the last automobile in the whole shipment has been checked out by the unloading inspector does the railroad yield responsibility and the rack car story comes to an end. On schedule, 
It's the arrival at an automobile assembly plant of a complete rolling stockroom. These high cube cars have more than doubled the capacity of vintage boxcars. Full of things ready at hand when needed. Not a moment too late, nor a moment too soon. Weeks ago, the timing of this train was worked out on a computer and given a slot on the assembly plant's flow of production chart. expected, the train reduces inventory problems and the cost of stockpiling. Thus, the railroad has become an integral extension of the automobile assembly line, which starts here in the unloading yard as the chassis frames, one by one, are fed onto the conveyor. of new directions in the world of transportation can be traced back over 100 years to a collaboration between the early railroads and railroading's first big customer. Piggyback is now one of the railroad industry's fastest growing services. The reason is obvious. It's a highway on wheels, offering door-to-door -door rail service to off-track shippers. With a gantry crane, trailers can be loaded or unloaded without having to move the other vehicles or containers already aboard. Containerized freight, which is part of the piggyback system, has many advantages to shippers. Not the least among them being that it eliminates rehandling of contents in transfer. The container being sealed from loading point to destination. Already in markets overseas, industries are equipped to expedite this type of shipment. principle, it's the same now as in circus days, one vehicle hitching a ride atop another. While its name, from the idiom of childhood, has grown to become one of the most challenging phrases in railroading today. Piggyback. New directions. The unit train, which carries bulk cargoes not by the car full, but by the train full, is a wholly new transportation concept.
here at Oceanside for export arrives a unit train of grain cars bearing 8,400 tons of Durham wheat in a single shipment. The 100 ton contents of each of the covered hopper cars will be unloaded within three minutes. Before the day is over, the Wheat Express will be on its way back to the American heartland, breadbasket of the modern world, for a quick refill. Hot steel slabs. Every week, some 6,000 tons of them are shipped 500 miles on regular schedules to a plate mill where they're rolled into finished steel. It's what you might call a hot example of the unit train as integrated into an industrial production chain, planned that way by railroad men meeting their customers' needs. to the electric utility industry is one of the nation's fundamental natural resources. We are next to the world's largest open pit coal mine in the vast loading area where the cars may slow down but never completely halt. The unit train for coal outcompetes any other means of joining mine with market, cost-wise, and every other way. The unit train is fundamental to the moving of coal, feeding the power plants. Here, indeed, is the train that never stops. A train which represents a systems concept of bulk cargo transportation as fundamental to the future of industry as the raw material it carries. This train runs 351 days a year, shuttling 600 miles every 48 hours between mine and generating station. And never for a moment is it free of some form of electronic surveillance or direct control. And so on coal-carrying railroads throughout America, the empty cars roll on back to the minehead to return on hundreds of tomorrows. What effect has the coal unit train upon the two industries it knits together? The economies it makes possible enable coal to compete with nuclear fuels. It means longer contracts for the coal companies and low rates for the consumer. In many ways and across the land, the new directions of modern railroading enrich our nation and ourselves. West coast or east, a concern of every urban community is public transportation. There was a time when it was hardly any problem. But today, more people, more traffic.
It makes no sense to allow our cities to choke themselves to death. A city is a dynamic entity. People and their goods must be moved. For railroad as for community, commuter transportation has become both problem and paradox. Nevertheless, new directions in inner city passenger transportation are being explored and developed by the railroads in partnership with the communities they're called upon to serve. And as well as within the city, people must be moved between cities. Success turns on technological breakthroughs, on new approaches, new directions. A complete rethinking of the problems and responsibilities of moving people, the country's basic natural resource. It's been said that we Americans today live out of the freight car. For preeminently, it's our railroads that bring the products of range, field, garden, and orchard to wholesale markets. Far more of us than ever before now experience the amenities of modern living. Our good fortune is supported by our railroads, which bring us many cargoes, for sport as much as for industry and business. How do things get here? We seldom stop to think. On one beach, they're for a family's pleasure, while on another beach, they're for the realization of the whole nation's hopes and ambitions. Two locomotives bringing a towering spaceship to the launching pad. Here America stands today. Yesterday she stood here where the golden spike opened for us a road to the Indies. It was our new direction then. And now, even if you were to journey to outer space, you'd go the first important earthbound miles, at least, on silvery rails.